you call miscommunication. See, I just assumed that when Steve stood here, that his mic here was off and he used the pulpit mic. And my wife tells me when I make assumptions, I get in trouble. <laughs> well, I guess I got in trouble. Uh, when, when you officially have the note on the board telling you to turn, turn the mic on, they may not have it up here, but up there it says, Pastor Jimmy, turn your mic on. So, and, and they were waving and doing the dance, so I thought, well, I might better turn that microphone on. It's good to be in God's house today, isn't it? I love the sunshine this morning, but I told Angela I was I was standing there combing my hair, and I said, I think the humidity is 500% this morning. She said, well, it's close to it. It's 79, I think. She, she looked it up, and I said, well, that's almost 500 in my book. So anyway, it's a beautiful day outside, and, and we have the light of God in our hearts this morning. Amen. And we have the light of his love, and we have the light of his word for us to look at today. Now, when Brother Steve told me he was going on vacation and was going to be gone, I talked to him about um, if he wanted me to continue on to, uh, with his series in 2 Corinthians or, or how he wanted me to handle that. He said, no, you just do uh, what you feel like God wants you to do, and we'll go with that. So if you were here Wednesday night, I, I started on using one of the Psalms, and uh, that particular psalm we covered was, was a good one, I thought. And what I did was um, I, I tried to introduce the folks here to what's called hermeneutics. And that's just a big word that you learn in Bible college about how to interpret God's word. And you, you approach it from a kind of a scientific standpoint. And you just break the passage down and, and try to figure out what it's saying to you. We did that on Wednesday evening and Wednesday night, and I'm planning on doing that again this Wednesday night. So... If you want to come learn some hermeneutics, then, then be here Wednesday night, and, and uh, you can be involved in that. But for this morning, I'd like to go back to the Psalms for just a moment and uh, call your attention to Psalm 130, verses 1 through 8. Psalm 130, verses 1 through 8. I, I don't know about you. I love the Psalms. Uh, I, I usually read them through several times in a year. Um, there's 150 Psalms. And so if you have the time and can do it and can commit to it, if you read five psalms a day, then you're going to cover the book of Psalms in a month by reading five a day. And what I've been doing lately is, like I said, several times I've read through the psalms in a month or a couple of months or whatever, however fast I wanted to go through them, in addition to, to other Bible reading that I do. But what I started trying to do recently, and I've gotten through about half the Psalms. I, I finished 82, I think, this morning, uh, if I remember right. But um, one of the things I'm trying to do is to go through and, and make notes and try to learn some different things. If you notice here, some people don't like to write in their Bibles, but I don't mind it. Because... This book is not God's word, the, the actual physical copy. Yes, it's got God, it contains God's word, yes. It's the scriptures, yes. But this, this book is going to wear out. The pages are going to turn yellow, and it's going to start falling apart. In fact, this one already has. Some of my Bible maps in the back have already come out, and they're on the desk in here in the office. And so what I'm getting at is it's okay to write in, your, in the scriptures. If God tells you something in, in a passage in makes an impression on you, write it down in the margin, and the next time you read that, you go, oh yeah, that was something God taught me right there. Or if you don't feel comfortable writing in the Bible, get you a journal, a notebook, and keep it beside you and write those thoughts down as, as you're studying. That's a freebie there this morning. <laughs> I do enjoy the opportunity to be in the pulpit today, and I hope that you're blessed from what we're going to cover today. Since I've been here working with you guys earlier in the year, one of the things that I've tried to emphasize to you is the importance of reading God's, reading God's Word on a daily basis and getting into the Scriptures and letting them teach you and help you to learn about God and the difference that He makes in our lives. And, and that's something that I have, have kept your focus on and I've encouraged you to do that. And I don't know if you read the newsletters we send out every two weeks, but but one of the things I'm trying to do there is to show you what it means to meditate on God's Word, 
to think on it, to consider it, and to let it be a part of your daily life. And so what I'd like to do this morning is to walk you through one of the Psalms and try to help you understand what it says and what a difference that can make in your life. And so that's what we're going to do. So let's, let's get busy with that. I want to point out just a couple of things about the Psalm before we actually read it. And, and I mentioned this on Wednesday evening. And so you guys that were here, look at the superscript and tell me who the writer of this song is. It's called a Psalm of Asaph, a song of Asaph. Now I've got to show you a little something about Asaph. Th what this song talks about in it, Asaph was already dead and gone. So it's probably written by one of his descendants who was just taking his name and writing under his name. So it's called a song of Asaph. Asaph was one of King David's contemporaries. And the things that are being talked about in this particular Psalm probably come from a different era, okay? And so keep that in mind as, as we look at that this morning. And I've got to get back over here to Psalm 130 because I lost my place. Sorry about that. There we go. Psalm 130. A song of a sense. And so it could have been written about As by Asaph. We don't know for sure, but it's possible. But certainly a song of a sense was, was written for the Jewish people. One of the things that the Jewish men were required to do was to go to Jerusalem three times a year for a national feast. They were to show up and be there. And so in this process of going to Jerusalem, they would use these songs, these songs of ascent, in order to sing them to each other and to encourage them to learn about the Lord and remind them about what God means to them. Now, what do you think it might mean, a song of ascents? Any idea? It just, the, the Hebrew word literally means walking up the steps. So you've got to have a little geography lesson this morning. All right? Jerusalem sits at an elevation of about 2,700 feet above all the surrounding countryside. So it doesn't matter which direction you're traveling to Jerusalem from, you have to go up in altitude to get there, therefore the ascending the steps. In fact, if you just, just not more than 30 miles away to the east is the Jordan Rift, the Jordan River Valley, and it sits below sea level. So you're going from below sea level at Jericho all the way up to 2,700 feet at Jerusalem in a distance of about 30 miles. And so that's a pretty good walk for people to go on. So if these Jewish men are coming to Jerusalem from different directions of the country for these national feasts, they've got a pretty good walk to go up to Jerusalem. And, that's, and so if you ever read the scripture and talk about going up to Jerusalem, that's what it's getting at. And so these travelers, they ascended or went up in order to reach the city. And so therefore these songs were called songs of ascent. In fact, it, it begins, uh, if I remember right, in Psalm 120 is the first one that's the Song of Ascents. Yes, Psalm 120, and goes through about Psalm 134, I believe, is the last one that's attributed as the Song of Ascent. And so they would sing these songs to each other in order to remind each other to be true to the Lord and to live for Him. And as they sang these songs, they were, they were passing the time as they made this trip to Jerusalem. And so let's look at the psalm and read it together. So you follow along with me. I'm going to be reading from the uh, New American Standard Translation. I told the folks Wednesday night I don't have a CSB translation that Steve reads out of. So it's going to read a little bit differently this morning. A song of a sense. He says, out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, indeed more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, Hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness. That's a beautiful word in the Hebrew that is, is kind of lost in translation sometimes. 
And, and that word in the Hebrew, it refers to the covenant love of God. You remember he went into a covenant with Abraham in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And then he renewed that covenant with all of Abraham's sons. And he had a covenant with David as well. And kind of a, a covenant with Solomon in the Old Testament. And a covenant is an agreement between the two parties where God says, if you do this, I will do this. And so this is referring to God's <coughs> upholding faithfully his part of the covenant. The agreement. And he says, for with the Lord, there is loving kindness. Sometimes this word is translated mercy in the Old Testament. And with him, going on in verse 7, is abundant redemption. Isn't that beautiful? For with the Lord, there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So a beautiful passage of scripture for us this morning. <clears throat> I think most of you would agree with me that we feel like our nation is in turmoil. Amen. And there are a lot of things that we've witnessed that have been going on over the past few weeks and months that are troubling to us, right? And when you look at the nation that we're in and the turmoil that's there, do you, do you feel like we might be treading some deep waters? How many of you guys like to go swimming? <laughs> or used to like to go swimming? <laughs> yeah. I, I remember in college down in Conway, Arkansas, there was a lake out north of town that we would go to. Uh, Lake Beaver Fork was the name of it, and they had a little beach area that you could go swimming at. Well, one of the things that we always tried to do, there was a buoy about probably a good quarter of a mile or further out from the, the beach, and it was, it was basically saying to the boat, you can't come inside this marker. Well, we would see who, if, if we could swim out to it. And so we would swim out to it, and we would hang on to it for a while, because the lake was a deep lake. I mean, we're, we're talking a couple hundred feet deep. And so you're out there in the middle of Lake Beaver Fork, and it's, it's about 150 to 200 feet to the bottom out there. And you better make sure and get a breather while you hung on to that buoy before you try to swim back. Because you didn't want to get into trouble and end up on the bottom of Lake Beaver Fork. But do you feel like you're, you're in deep waters like that, and you're just treading, trying to keep your head up above the waters? You ever felt like that before? And it, and it may not do, be just because our nation is turmoil. It could be a lot of different reasons yeah. why we might feel that way. Dealing with some health issues. Uh, dealing with uh, relationship issues that, that we're having with, with a spouse or, or with a child or, or something of that nature. And, and the thing is, none of us are immune to those kinds of things, are we? And it's going to happen to all of us. And, and so we have to be ready for it. We have to be prepared for it. And the way to do that is best stated this way. When you are overwhelmed by life, look to the Lord. That's the point I want you to get this morning. When you are overwhelmed by life, look to the Lord. Now, the psalmist here, and I made a mistake earlier, and, and I know that's a shock to many of you. I have a good reason for making that mistake. I was reading Psalms 80, uh, 80 and 81, uh, 79, 80, and 81 this morning, I think it was, and a couple of those were written by Asaph. And so when I started out preaching this sermon, I, I was just transposing Asaph over to this particular psalm, trying to speak from memory. Sometimes I scare my wife and family that way, so when I don't get things right from memory. That's okay. Actually, the psalmist is not identified in this text. And in the superscript, it's a song of ascents and not a song of Asaph. So all that you wrote down about Asaph, just erase it off and put down about the life of ascents. Yes, preachers are human too. But don't hold on to that thought too long, okay? <laughs> well, this particular psalm finds himself, and this particular psalmist finds himself 
in an overwhelming situation. And we know that from how he begins the psalm there in verse 1 when he says, Out of the depths have I, have I cried to you, I've cried to you. And so what I want to show you this morning is how he chose to handle the situation. What he chose to do in response to the circumstances and the situation that he found himself in. So there's two basic parts to the psalm, verses 1 through 4 and then verses 5 through 8. And in the first part, we're going to look at the psalmist's cry to the Lord. His cry to the Lord in verses 1 through 4. And that's where he says in verse 1, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. And that's where he begins there in verses 1 and 2. And what I see happening in verses 1 and 2 is a hopeless situation. He's in the depths. His circumstances are overwhelming to him. And he's aware of that. And he's realizing that he has nothing within himself that's going to help him get out of that situation. Literally, what it says here, when he says, I, out of the depths I have cried to you, he says, out of the deep waters I have cried to you. And what this indicates to us figuratively is that he's implying his deep distress. So we don't know from what he's writing exactly what his circumstances were or what situation he finds himself in. But one of the things that you've got to understand is that he realized and understood that it was a heavy situation weighing him down to a point of hopelessness. Have you ever been in that type of a situation before? You ever said to someone, I've got this going on in my life and I don't know which way to turn? Well, that's where the psalmist is in this particular psalm. That's what he's dealing with. And it's something that he's struggling with. And it's something that he is just feeling overwhelmed about. Now, one of the things I want you to realize is that some people realize their situation more easily than others. Some people just don't. They just go through life. They just get up and they plug along and they, they put one foot in front of the other, as you kind of say, and they just say, well, that's just life. And they keep looking to themselves to get through the difficult circumstances instead of turning to the one that can help them the most. You ever seen a, an individual or a family who prospers in life and seems to have everything together? And you're wondering, do they ever have any problems in life? Well, I guarantee you they do. They just hide it really well. Because the scriptures tell us that we're going to have troubles and we're going to have trials. And it's just going to happen. You know, there, there are a lot of things that, that weigh on us. And I understand the depths of despair. I understand the deep waters. And, and there's been several things in, in my life that I can pull from as, as evidence that I understand what the depths of despair can be. And, um, you know, I, I've mentioned some of that to you before. One of them was, you know, that early morning phone call telling me that my brother had passed away. Uh, another early morning phone call telling me my dad had had a, a stroke and was, was headed to the hospital and didn't know if he was going to make it or not. Those two phone calls happened when we lived in Colorado. So, so yeah, it's, I understand about the depths of despair. And also when a, a church that you poured six years of your life into helping start the church and get it going, and they, the pastor calls you in and says, I hate to say this, but we're going to eliminate your position. And so you, you've got a couple of months and you're, you're done here. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, I understand. And because I understand, I can look at the scriptures and I can encourage you this morning of what's going on here today. In Job 14, 1, Job writes and he says this, Those born of women are of few days and full of trouble. <laughs> How many of you here have a mother? <laughs> you were born of a woman. Every one of you. Me included. 
So that truth of God's word hits you and me, all of us. Those born of women are a few days and full of trouble. So do you know the depths of the Lord, the depths of the, of the situation, the troubling waters, the overpowering situation? If you do, you can identify with the psalmist. And when you get to verse 2, he's really wondering about what's going to happen. He doesn't know what the outcome is going to be yet. And in fact, in verse 2, there's still a hopeless situation going on here that he finds himself in. And he's not knowing if God's going to hear him or not. In verse 2, he's crying out to the Lord, and, and it's kind of like, Lord, are you listening? Do you hear what I'm saying? He wasn't sure that God was hearing him. He wasn't sure that God was understanding him. And then we come to verse 3, and we still see a hopeless situation here when he says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? That's a verse that uh, we have the Awana with kids learn in the Awana ministry. If you should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Iniquities there means moral failures. And here's something the psalmist realized. And it might have been a, a sinful uh, habit of his that, that brought on these depths of despair. But whether it be that or not, we don't know for sure. But one of the things we do know is something that he realized. And here's the truth about God that we don't want to deal with much today. The fact is... God, in his sovereignty, could look up a record of your sins and my sins to be held in reserve for future judgment. So the psalmist is in this situation. What the cause of it is, we don't know. But something he realizes, Lord, I don't have a prayer if you mark my iniquities down and keep them in a record book and then bring them out for judgment later. I don't either. There's no answer in this life and what we have in this life to our sinfulness. There's no answer. And that's what the psalmist is realizing right here. And he says, if you mark iniquities, Lord, who can stand? Who can stand in the face of God's judgment? There would be no hope. Our sins take away any hope that might be there. Think of it like this. Let's say you do three things a day that, that displease God, that disobey Him. You think something, you say something, or you do something that, that goes against God's Word. Three sins a day. Roughly by the end of a year, you've got a thousand sins to your credit. If you live to the average age of 70, you have 70,000 sins against God on your record. <laughs> So what do you think a traffic judge would do if you were standing before him with 70,000 unpaid traffic violations? Well, the psalmist realized this. He didn't like what he saw. He didn't like what he was feeling. And so he, he begins to hope in the one that can take care of the situation for him. And that's where we come to verse 4. And he says in verse 4, but there is what? Forgiveness in you that you may be feared. There is forgiveness in you that you may be feared. And he's talking to the Lord here. In verse 4, there's a word, little word, but. One of my seminary professors gave us a real deep theological concept based on the word but one day. He called it a corner word. He said, you're walking down the sidewalk and you come to the word but in the scriptures and you turn the corner, you're in a different direction. Now. You see, he's talking about hopelessness in verses one through three, but verse four begins and he turns the corner and what does he see? He sees hope. He sees forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he now becomes confident that the Lord has heard and has sent a Savior. And when you look at verse 4 again, there's forgiveness, hope with you. Imagine with me this situation. You've been lost on the open ocean for days, for whatever reason, we don't know. You've been crying out to God for him to rescue you, and you're beginning to wonder if God heard. 
Then you hear the sound, distant sound of the engines of an airplane. And you can tell they're getting closer. And, and when you hear that noise, you, you begin to ho have hope. It rises up within you and hope is beginning. Next you see the pilot dip his wingtips as he passes over you as a signal to you that he's seen you in the life raft there. And now you begin to have more hope. And, and your hope now blossoms into joy and relief. And then shortly later, the rescue ship comes on the horizon and gets larger and larger until he's there to rescue you. You're now saved. That's the forgiveness of the Lord. That's the forgiveness of the Lord that frees you from your guiltiness. That frees you from having those 70,000 unaccounted for sins on your record. Because when you cry out to the Lord for forgiveness and to save you from your sins, he wipes the record clean. He erases it all. In fact, the scripture says that he puts your sins in the depths of the ocean, those deep waters that you find yourself in. He's now put them in there, never to be heard of and found again. Isn't that joyful? Amen. Isn't that good news? So instead of punishing us, he forgives us. And the reason that he forgives us in his son Jesus Christ is so that we'll reverence him and worship him. There's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. God created you to have a relationship with him. But due to man's sinfulness, we broke the relationship. And so there's brokenness in our world and sinfulness in our world. And we all try different things at different times to take care of the brokenness. But what happens is we get out of the brokenness for a moment and then we're back into it. That's the life of an addict. They get out of the addiction for a period of time but they're pulled right back in because of the brokenness. And only when they cry out to God for salvation in Jesus Christ, his only true son, do they overcome the brokenness to find peace back with God in a right relationship that he created you for to begin with. Amen. So there's hopelessness in life, but with Christ there's hope. And that's what the psalmist is calling us to remember this morning. In fact, when we reverence and we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're bringing him the glory, we're giving him the honor, and that's as it should be. And then we come to verses 5 through 8. So we started out in hopelessness, verses 1 through 4, but uh, verse 3. But then we come to verse 4, and hope is beginning, hope is rising, and, and we have forgiveness in the Lord. And then look at the psalmist's commitment to continue to hope, beginning in verse 5. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. And then he calls Israel to hope. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is forgiveness and loving kindness. And with him is abundant redemption. And then there's a general principle in verse 8. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. So instead of despairing and being overwhelmed, make a commitment to hope. Whatever situation you find yourself in this morning, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, realize that he can help you get out of the hopelessness and bring you into the hope that you should have. And he will do that for you if you cry out to him. So in verse 5, there's hope and trust. There's hope beginning. And as I said, it was rising up and, and it's beginning in the, in the psalmist's life here. And, and the emphasis in verse 5 is upon the word, upon the Lord and his word. God's word, if we accept it and trust in it and lean on it, it calms any unrest that we find in our lives and transforms everything into peace. Because if you are following God's word, you're following the Lord Jesus Christ. And Ephesians tells us that Jesus is our peace. And that's the beauty of God's word. In verse 6 we come to and we see hope continuing to increase here. And I think what the psalmist is saying in verse 6 is that he's making a commitment 
to look toward God in future distressing situations. He, he, it's the idea of he, he's turned towards the Lord expectantly like those who in the night look for the coming morning. Did you catch in verse 6 he talked about the watchman? You ever heard the old saying, is, is the darkest right before the dawn? In the Jewish Old Testament system, there were four watches in the night, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., 9 p.m. to 12 p.m., 12 p.m. to 3 a.m., and then 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. And so can you imagine if you're one of those running the, the fourth watch, the 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. watch? You know the sun's coming. But in anticipation, you think, man, is that sun never going to come up today? You know, it's, it's dark out here. I'm, I'm ready to go home and crawl into bed and, and get some shut-eye. But I've got things to do. And if, it, you know, if that sun doesn't hurry up and come up, well, here's the thing. They're waiting for the sun to come up. Yes, they're watching for the sun to come up. But there's no doubt here, you see. You know why? They know the sun's coming up. There's no question of whether the sun's going to come up. They're just wondering when it's going to happen. And that's the way it is with waiting on the Lord. There's no doubt when we're waiting in, in God's will that it's going to happen, but we just are wondering when it's going to happen. Lord, when are you going to deliver me? When are you going to help me get out of this situation? I know you're going to do it for me. I've asked you to do it. You've tr I'm trusting in you to do it for me, and I'm waiting for you. See, that's the idea of hope and waiting. You know, when, when a kid is looking for something that they want, that I mean, it's just, they're obsessed with it, you know? A, a new bicycle, a new whatever. And, and they're, they're bugging you every moment about a new, that new bike. But they don't know if they're going to get it or not, do they? There's, a, there's an, uh, an amount of uncertainty there. But with the Lord, there is no uncertainty. With the Lord, he loves you, and if you cry out to him for help in life, and that's why I told the kids this morning, Mass, the pastor's kids, whatever you find yourself in that's overwhelming and troubling to you, you can cry out to the Lord, and he will hear you, and he will bring you out of the trouble. Now, he may not take away the circumstances, but he'll give you a heart and mind to handle the situation. Then we come to verse 7, and, and we see hope and courage. And there's something I think the psalmist realizes in verse 7. If this is true for him, it's true for all people. And he encourages those reading this psalm to hope and to trust in the Lord. Because the Lord is Lord over all. There's a beautiful word there in verse 7. I, I mentioned a moment ago, loving kindness. His mercy and his covenant loyalty to do as he promised to all those who believe. Jesus says, you will have trouble in this life, in this world. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. <clears throat> and then we come to verse 8. Hope available for all. You see, there's, there's been a progression up to where we are now with verse 8. And even in verse 8, there's still a progression reflected here. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Redemption involves a payment, you see. Redemption involves a payment. Any of you guys ever collect green stamps way back when? <laughs> you go to the grocery store, you spend $100, and that checkout lady would zip that thing around and deal out to the hundred mark and you'd get some green stamps and you'd take them home. Yeah. Well, and then you could take green stamps down to the, to the green stamp store mm -hmm. and you could give them so many booklets of stamps and uh -huh. get you something out of the store. Yeah. But you wouldn't have any green stamps unless you had spent the money at the grocery store, would you? They're involved, it involves a payment. So somebody had to pay for the iniquities of us all. And that was Jesus Christ. <laughs> He's the Redeemer. He's the one that paid the price. And so we can have hope this morning. When you are overwhelmed by life, look to the Lord. Amen. Look to Jesus. 
He is our hope. And when you do that, then encourage those around you to do the same. That's what the psalmist is doing here. It's as if the psalmist said in this, in this particular psalm, I was hopeless and wasn't sure the Lord would hear. I knew he was my only hope because forgiveness is in him. He did hear me, and I have hope and forgiveness in Jesus. Now I hope in him alone through his word. Trust in him. Trust his loving kindness, his mercy, his grace. He will do the same for you as he's done for me. <coughs> Isn't that beautiful, y'all? So I hope you've been encouraged this morning. I hope that brings you some peace. You need the Lord. I need the Lord more today than I ever have. I've been walking with the Lord in salvation since I was 10 years old. I'm 59, so it's been a few years. Have I always been as close to the Lord as I am at other times? No. Am I as close today? I don't know. I hadn't asked myself that question and thought about it. But I encourage you to, to look at your heart this morning. You need the Lord whether you realize it or not. So I encourage you to call on Him, to trust Him, to turn to Him. Because God is more to you than you realize. He's your forgiveness. He's your mercy. He's your loving kindness. And He's your Redeemer. Let's pray together. The invitation time is going to be yours to respond as God leads you to. I encourage you to look at yourself this morning as far as where you might be with the Lord today. Are you struggling with something? If you are, I'd be willing to, to visit with you during the invitation or, or right after we dismiss. I'll be glad to visit with you. Try to encourage you to trust God more. Any of our staff, Brother Randy, Brother David, you feel like you need to know Christ as your Savior, we'll be glad to show you how to do that. Some of these other adults in here would love to show you as well. Father, I thank you for the day, and I thank you for the joy we have of knowing you, for the joy that we have in trusting you, the hope that we have. Forgive us, Lord, when we have dependent on ourselves, our own wisdom, our own knowledge to get us through situations every day. God, call us to turn it over to you at the beginning of the day. You can carry it. Your shoulders are more than big enough to carry our burdens. So help us to cast all our cares on you, Lord, because you care for us. Thank you for the psalmist. Thank you for the words you inspired him to write in his song. And God, I pray that you would strengthen our hope in you today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.